singing grace how sweet the sound that saved a rich like me behold i tell you a mystery the word behold is kind of an interesting word because I don't know that we realize that, 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 that that's an imperative and it's an exclamation, behold. It should be much stronger. It's not a, this is not a light idea. This is not, I mean, this is a very strong introduction to an, a subject. Behold. Say, behold. It, it would be like... Uh, 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 an introduction to a celebrity or uh, the president or something where you have the, the music or some kind of very, um, a, a, a very way, a very strong way of announcing the appearance of somebody and it's, that this is what this is. The word behold. Uh, behold, I tell you a mystery, musterion, and then he, he, and now he introduces it. He says, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. This is not the trumpets of Revelation. This is, has nothing to do with that. Those are all Jewish age. This is church age. And... and I'll talk about it a little more, but I don't want you to get distracted. This has nothing to do with the Jewish age. Look, how did he start out? How did he introduce this subject? Mystery. Behold, I tell you a mystery. Right? That's how he introduced his subject. This last chump is part of the mystery of the rapture of the church. It has nothing to do in fact, until this trumpet sounds, the other seven will not. This trumpet is for the church. You understand that? We is the church age. Some of the church age is living. Some of the church age is dead. The we in this subject matter is the church. <clears throat> in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable must, and that word must is an imperative. That word is a separate word from put on. This is deo, deo, and it's a present active imperative. Uh, third person singular, for this perishable must put on, that is a word, this is a very common word uh, for Paul. Paul uses this word, sometimes this word is called put on or clothed. And for example, he uses this same word in 2 Corinthians when he's talking about the resurrection and he calls it clothed. It's in duo. For this perishable must put on, imperishable, the mortal must put on the immortal or immortality. But when this perishable has put on imperishable and the mortal has put on immortality, then will come about the saying, quoting Isaiah 25.8, that is written, death is swallowed up into victory. There will be no victory over this death until the last trump inner end is blown and we begin the order of the resurrection. Christ is the first fruit and then the order are those whose Christ had is coming. Church age, Jewish age, millennial age, and then, but this, the last trump is the sound of the beginning of the victory over death. When that is completed, then we have that completion. Then, then is fulfilled what was written 
death is swallowed up into victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of sin, uh, the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, and then he goes on. I just want to pick up the first part of this. In our first lesson, you recall that I broke the 15th chapter down into six ses sessions, uh, sections for study, and we're in the final section. I'm only looking at part of that because this is my first lesson. I'm really focusing on verses uh, 51, 2, and 3, to be exact, today. I'm dealing with the subject matter uh, of, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. I'm dealing with that principle in our lesson today. We're going to look at, I guess, maybe five ideas on that subject matter after a word of prayer. Let us pray. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt with the Holy Spirit, the privilege to confess sin, if necessary. It's a self-examination. It's because you are a believer priest, according to 1 Peter 2. Can't study the Bible in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. Personal sin is dealt with by confession of it to the Father. Not for salvation, but for sanctification, for the ministry of the Holy Spirit, teaching the truth of the Word of God. That should be in accordance with 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all sin. I give you a moment of privacy of your own priesthood to take care of that so we can study the Word of God under spiritual conditions. Father, how thankful we are for this opportunity to be in assembly with those who have visited with us, both coming in by automobile and those by Internet. We pray, Father, that this message on the mystery of the rapture of the church uh, would be meaningful because we live in the last days. Christ has come. He's died on the cross. He's been buried. He's been raised for the salvation of everyone who believes that, called the gospel, and he's coming again. Every time we take in the Eucharist, we honor the fact that he has come and he's coming again. And when he comes, he's coming for the church, and it begins the whole eschatology program of the last hour of the last day. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here we are in the mystery of the rapture. When he talks about the, when we talk about the mystery of the rapture, we're talking about the mystery of Christ, which is the mystery of the church. The mystery of the rapture, it was a, and it's a, it is a mystery doctrine. The mystery of the rapture is the mystery of Christ, which is the mystery of the church. And that's important that we understand that. When when we deal with 1 Corinthians 15, 51, I tell you a ministry, be, uh, behold, I, I tell you, uh, I said ministry, but I, I meant mis mystery. We are the church age believers. We will not all sleep. This word for sleep for the, a euf as a euphemism for death is not just a church age idea. Let me, let me explain for what I mean by that. For example, in the death of Lazarus in John the 11th chapter, he tells his disciple that there's been word that Lazarus is sick and the disciples are debating on, with, the, with the Lord. Not the Lord is involved in this debate, but they're debating among themselves with the Lord uh, present about whether they should go or not because he says... Uh, I've got to know that he is sick, and after a few days, we're going to go there. Well, even, even then, they wondered, why would you wait? And then, well, I know why he's waiting, because the enemy is out to get him. And he says, no, uh, Lazarus. And so the point is, is what he says to them, Lazarus is not dead, he's asleep and I'm going to go and awaken him. He says, Lazarus has fallen asleep. So when you read that subject matter, what you find out, that when he gets there, Lazarus has been dead four days, and Jesus called it asleep. And so we're introduced to this subject matter that Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 1, 1551, that believers who have died, are asleep and will be awakened, not, 
we're not talking about the soul, we're talking about the body concept. The body concept. <clears throat> so we are familiar with this idea of sleep as a, as a, a term used for a deceased who, who is a believer. I'm, uh, Jesus says to him, I'm going to uh, awaken him. <clears throat> when they get there, he's been dead four days. And so they're wondering, what, 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 is, what does that mean? And he shows them what it means because he raised them from the dead. Now he came back in a recess, what we call resuscitation and not resurrection. He came back in resuscitation, which means he's going to have to die again. <clears throat> but the, my point was is that the word is used. The word is used. It, it was a concept. And it was a concept that a believer died. He, had, he was asleep or had to await the resurrection body. You do know that your, when you go to sleep at night, it is your body that sleeps. That's why you dream your soul never sleeps. If your soul sleeps, it's going to wake up in heaven. <laughs> so I just thought I'd let you know that. Now, I want to show you the, the, the idea of, of mystery here, of the rapture. Let me show you the mystery of it. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Colossians, the first chapter, and verse 27. In verse 26, he takes his subject of mystery. This is the mystery which has been hidden from ages, past ages and generations, but now has been manifest to his saints, to whom God willed, verse 27, to make known what is the riches of his glory of this mystery, among the Gentiles, that is, Christ in you, the hope of glory. The great mystery is the church. The great mystery. And here's the great mystery of the church, that in the church there's equality. Galatians, the third chapter, 26 through 29, talks about it. No Jew, no Gentile, female, male. You know, he goes through this whole list of equality in Christ. In Christ, we are, we are equal in Christ. There is none of this and none of that. There are no social or financial or racial or any other guides of separation. It is inclusiveness. And you see, that was, that was a phenomenal concept and that the Gentiles could come into the church on equal footing was, uh, and the Jews struggled with it all through the book of Acts. In fact, they still struggle with it. A lot of people struggle with, because, but in Christ there's equality. And so this is a powerful idea. I, I like the fact that this, what Paul calls part of the glorious riches he calls them glorious riches. I mean, we take it for granted that we have equality in Christ. But what you ought to do is thank God for that kind of grace because it comes from the riches of, his, of God's glory that we have this. There's nothing like the church age. Nothing like it. But you and I in the millennium will be in a resurrection body. This church age is nothing like it. All three members of God had working in your life, through your life, to do the things of God on earth. Who has ever heard of such a thing? I mean, this is an amazing day. And I don't think, I think we sleep halfway through our, our, our living life by not realizing the importance of, of our hour of destiny. The fact that God allowed you to live in the time of historical importance that you live in is just a phenomenal idea. Just a phenomenal idea. In 1 Corinthians, uh, uh, excuse me, in uh, Ephesians 5, uh, 32, the mystery is great, Paul says, but I am speaking with reference to Christ in his church. He's talking about marriage. It, 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 as illustration, but he said, no, I'll tell you what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the, the, the mystery is great. I'm talking about Christ and his church. 
I use marriage as, as, a, as an illustration. I, I find that. But listen, what I find, the mystery is great. Christ and his church. Christ and his church. Now, when I think about a mystery, a mystery requires two things. A mystery requires to, for you to understand that it involves divine, divine uh, uh, revelation and interpretation. Because it's been hidden, and now it's out in the open, it has to be understood. It involves divine revelation. It always involves these two things, divine revelation and divine interpretation. And it's important that the mystery is involving the church age, so you don't want to confuse all the different dispensations with the church. That's important. Now, recently, we, are, we have been in uh, Genesis 41. We've been studying Pharaoh's dream. He had two, you recall. And uh, two uh, said that that was certainty to come past soon uh, in the plan of God. Remember, we talked about that. Well, you see, that dream is, was a mystery until that was a mystery in the land of Egypt with all the wise people in it was a mystery until the, until the divine revelation was interpreted. Then they said, well, you know, the seven fat cows, that's the seven years of, of plenty, and the seven skinny cows are going to eat the fat cows. That's the famine. And then he did it with uh, grain, the seven good heads of grain are being eaten or swallowed up, swallowed up by the others. You see, it, it was a mystery, a mystery in concept until there was a, a, an understanding that this was a divine revelation and needed an interpretation. The mystery is such a thing. And when we have it, you're looking at church age you always remember that. That will help you, guide you in your thinking so you don't try to bring other dispensational concepts into it and mess it up. Like, for example, like that trumpet. They hear the last trumpet. They jump, jump over to the seven trumpets that is to Israel. They bring them all in. It screws the whole thing up. And we live in a day in the theology of the church when they don't believe in dispensations to start with, and their theology is screwy anyhow, as far as terms and times and how things fit. So one must be careful in there. There's a good reason why, why the Lord tagged this thing, the mystery. The mystery is the mystery of the church. Paul makes it clear in Ephesians 5.32. He just, I mean, he just says it. In 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, he says, on spiritual gifts, he says, now you, talking about the Corinthian believers, you are Christ's body and individual members of it. He calls the church the body of Christ. It is the body of Christ that is involved in the rapture. The body of Christ is going to be raptured. Come on now. Be, and listen, and it's going to come after his bodily resurrection. He's the first fruits of it. The church is a bodily resurrection. All right, there's two parts to the church. There is the part of the church that has died and gone to be with Christ in heaven, 2 Corinthians 5, 8. And there's the part of the church that's going to be living and is going to be changed. So what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, the mystery is this. He says, in the, in, let me read it, we shall not all sleep, that is, we don't have to die to be part of it, we will not all sleep, that's talking about the deceased church age believers who are already with Christ in heaven, are you with me, at the throne, but in difference, in difference to that, while we won't all sleep, we shall all be changed, and he's talking to living believers. Do you have that? So there's going to be two categories. In the rapture of the church, the body of Christ is going to be raptured. The body of Christ, the church. Part of that body is in heaven with the Lord, 
and is going to come back with him. The other half, and they're dead. The other half is alive. They're going to, they, they're going to be changed. You understand? Their body. That's important. You understand that. Now, what he's talking about, which is interesting to me, what he's talking about in 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 27, are spiritual gifts. Because every believer is uniquely placed by God into the church with a spiritually gifted ministry. And when the rapture comes, that whole kit and caboodle is going to be, leave the earth. That whole kit and caboodle of church ministry is going to leave the earth. That's a powerful idea in 1 Corinthians 12 before we ever get to 15. So that when we get to 15, that whole great operation that the church has on earth is going to be removed from the earth. And Gary Horton, that's a big ministry going on throughout this world. It's going to be, listen, it's not going to be just the church people that are missing. It's the church influence. It's the church ministry. This awesome work that God is doing on earth is going to be removed. You talk about a gap. You talk about a vacuum. That's something, isn't it? Now, here's a second point that I want to make with you. The mystery of the rapture of the church is based on the resurrection, ascension, session, and the, and the prophetic promise of the return of Christ. Every bit of that. The mystery of the rapture is based on the resurrection, the ascension, accession, and the prophetic promise of the return of Christ. All of that has to be true for the rapture to occur. And if all of that is true, the rapture will occur. You can put it on your schedule. It's going to come. It's going to come. It's more sure than tomorrow is Monday. Or today is the first day of the week. Because the one who has laid it out is the one who's put that whole schedule up to start with. In 1 Corinthians 15, 23, we have been reminded earlier, but each one his own order. Christ the first fruits. After that, those who are Christ at his coming. And the first in that order is the church, second the, the Jewish age, and third the millennial age. That's the order. That's the dispensational order. In 1 Thessalonians 4, which is the other great... See, there are three things on there. People all say, oh, you don't believe in the rapture. Of course I do. Paul believed in it. Of course I do. It's taught in 1 Corinthians 15. It's taught in 1 Thessalonians 4. And it's taught in 2 Corinthians 5. Of course I believe in it. Of course I believe in it. I mean, Paul believed in it. Of course I believe in it. In 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, verse 17, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. Who is coming to? Who is coming for? The church. Coming for the church. He's coming. The body of Christ is going to be raised. The body of Christ is going to be raptured and receive the resurrection body. And it's called the change. The big change is what it's called. But listen, but the dead in Christ, that's those who are with him, will rise first. You know what that means? They're already, what does it mean rise first? It means get the resurrection body. They're going to get the resurrection body. And you know where the resurrection body is going to come from? It's going to come from heaven. If you've paid any attention 
to what Paul has taught you in 1 Corinthians 15, 42 through 49, you know that. He listed them. He put this category over here, the earth and the earthy, the heaven and the heavenly. And he went through all kinds of discussions in the 15th chapter to show that to you. You've got to get on page with him. I hear so many crazy stuff on this. They just, listen, just let the Bible speak to your heart and accept it. Unless this, listen, you plant a seed unless it dies. And if it dies, the DNA in it will produce something that's completely different than what was put in it other than the DNA, right? You can't plant a seed of corn. What comes up? A stock with, with ears. I mean, how many illustrations does it, you, you plant an acorn, when the tree comes up, it don't look like an acorn. It better produce fruit or we don't know what it is unless you're a tree expert. I don't know. Here's three. Pay attention to two key words regarding the rapture of the church. It is the word sleep and change that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15. He talks about sleep and change uses two completely different words, two completely different words. When he's talking about those asleep, he's talking about those church-age believers who have died and are with Christ. When he's talking about change, he's talking about those who are living in Christ. He says, we shall not all sleep, future passive indicative, but we shall all be changed, future passive indicative. I have discussed that sleep is a euphemism for the death of a believer as far as the church age is concerned. It describes, listen to me now, it describes, this sleep describes the period between the church age believer's death and the rapture. He calls it sleep. For the rest of us, he calls it living. The living and those who are asleep. In 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, verse 8, be of good courage, I say, and prefer to be absent from the body to be at home, or um, this word for home is an interesting word in the Greek language because it means to be among, among one's own people. You see, it has the word where we get the word democracy, D-E-M-O-S is the word for people. Then you got the word in, meaning among the people. This word, absent from the bodies to be home or among his own people. Believers are going to be with Christ. That's and they're his people. That's who are asleep. The euphemism. In, in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, also described in 6, 15, and 58, now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. It's a, re it's a reference to those who are in this period between having died and waiting for the rapture to come so they can get their resurrection bodies. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 14, a principle is brought out. Christ will bring those who are asleep in Christ with him in the rapture. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, there's your gospel. Even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Okay? Okay? And they that, bring, that he brings with them will receive their body before ours, but in a split second of timing, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we will get ours. But he gives a, a listen, the first get the first. We're the second. That's the first string. We're the second string. 
Number four, often key words are missed in this passage. Often key words are missed because they're used a lot and overlooked. I'm going to give you an example, the word all. In verse 51, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. See that? You don't have a right to change at all. If you were a believer in Christ, I don't care what kind of condition you were when you left this world. If you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, when you died, you went to be with the Lord. If you're alive and you're a believer in the gospel of Jesus Christ, I don't care if you're carnal or spiritual, when the Lord comes back, you go. Who are you to change the word all? He died for all so that all could go. People get this foolishness in their heart about who can and who can't. Let me tell you, God settled that score at the cross. There is equality in Christ. And let me tell you, we live in a day of grace. I'll live in a day of law. You think that God has some of us out there counting, well, you can go, you can't. It... Quit that foolishness. The word is all. All who are living in Christ. If you're in Christ, and listen, when you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are, you are baptized by the Holy Spirit into Jesus Christ. If you're into Jesus Christ, and you are if you believe because the baptism of the Holy Spirit puts you there, then you're a new creation in Christ. You have eternal life. I mean eternal life. I don't mean temporary. You'll be amazed when you get to heaven who's there and who's not. It'll be based on the Lord Jesus Christ or it won't be based on anything. At the rapture, two groups of church-age believers will receive their bodies. Those who are asleep or the deceased, church-age believers, according to 1 Thessalonians 4.16, and the living, according to verse 17. And we will be changed. Our physical body will be changed without going through death. We step right out of this living body into a living body forever. Because this is a temporal body. This is a temporal tent. But we have a building from God in heaven. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. Changed. Raised, changed. He says the imperishable put on, the mortal will put on immortality. How good is that? Man, that's a change to you and I. How could we wrap our brain around that? Just faith. This change of the living at the rapture is explained as putting off. And duo means to be clothed. It means to, to put off. You're going to put off the perishable and you're going to put on the imperishable. You're going to put off the mortal and you're going to put on the immortal. Putting on. And it's not your wardrobe, it's his for you. Not something you hang up in your closet and go like, oh, wait, 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 wait. Let me get my jacket. In a moment, in a split second of time, before you could even think of what's going on, boom, it's gone. You've been changed. It means you don't even have a, you don't have a chance to look around. I mean, in a split second. 
Think about that. I mean, nothing, you can't reach back and get anything. Think about that. Whatever your favorite is, you don't have a split second of time. Well, let me grab my hat. Let me grab my... No, grab nothing. Grab Jesus. The only thing you can grab now is grab Jesus. <laughs> grab Jesus. That's all you got going. Two changes are listed in our passage. You're going to... You're going to... You're going to... Change. You're not going to have to put off the perishable. He's going to do it for you. He's going to do it for you. In a split second of time, he's going to do it for you. Boom, boom. Just like that. He is going to dress you. In a split second of time, he's going to take off. He's going to drop the perishable and put on the imperishable. Mortal, immortal. You know, how, you know what that is? That's grace. Grace and salvation, grace and life, grace and dying, grace and the rapture. It's all grace. It's all grace. It's all grace. I tell you what you don't want to miss. You don't want to miss dying for Christ. So I think, I, th I, th I kind of think that way, see. In 1 first, in first Corinthians, in Corinthians 15, 53, 54, we are told that the perishable must put on imperishable and the mortal, and God does it. I mean, we, can, we can't do anything in a split second of time, can we? Well, I, as you get older there, you, you can go to the bathroom and split. Probably that's a professor thing you do. <laughs> In a twinkling of an eye, that's about it. That's about the fastest I move. You need to read that. I want to close with 2 Corinthians 5.4. Let me close with this. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed to be clothed. That's our word. Same word put on. With our heavenly dwelling... Notice that heavenly dwelling so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. And he's talking about life everlasting. I tell you, three of the great passages on the rapture of the church is going to be 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4, and 2 Corinthians 5. You should read them. You should read them for that is the message. Well, let's do our... Our, let's let's do our pledge, and then we're going to have a, a prayer. So, all right, Rick, if you do it, and then uh, Horton, you close us in prayer after our pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. How could we just not feel and experience all that 1 Corinthians 15 is trying to teach us? You covered it all. Your amazing grace, mercy. I thank you, Father, for those in this church who know how to teach the truth without compromise. I thank you for your grace. Thank you that you have got your hands on America and that revival still could come. Mm. Dear God, only when we humble ourselves under the mighty hand. Bless these wonderful people in India right now who are reaching thousands of kids. Those that are going to go this month. Just thank you, Father, for so much of who and what you are. Our stability based on how we apply your word to our life. I praise you. May the source be with us. In Jesus' name.
the sound that it's 